are continuing in Acts 15 today. And Brother Jason, I think that we're going to call this sermon, if we had to title it, and I know we do on YouTube, uh, Disputation and Reconciliation. Disputing and Reconciling. Um, to bring you up to date, because you guys haven't been here for way too long, Paul and Barnabas were on their missionary journey, and they went all over the place, which we talked about. And you will remember what we were discussing and looking at recently was the question of circumcision had come up. And it, it was a stumbling block before the new Gentile believers. And so they all had to go back to Jerusalem where there was a council of the elders. Right, A council of the elders was held to resolve this dispute about do the Gentiles have to be circumcised in order to hear the word preached to them and, and that kind of thing. And you will remember that they, they came to the conclusion that this uh, council of elders did that as long as the Gentiles immediately refrain from uh, idols, right, food worship to idols, fornication, strangling uh, their food or their, their sacrifice and blood, stop those four things, they're good. They'll get the rest later when, when? When they go to the synagogue on Shabbat and, and hear Torah spoken, right? And so they draft this letter up that says this, and to give the letter more weight, because this had become a, a point where a lot of people are thinking, man, I don't know if I really can follow this way or not. Um, they sent two brothers, two well-tested brothers who had risked their lives for Yeshua, and those were Barsabbas and Silas. So Barsabbas and Silas go back with Paul and Barnabas, back to the people, to say, hey, here's the deal, and oh, by the way, we brought these guys from Jerusalem, so you hear it out of their lips as well. Back to Antioch. All right, so we're going to pick up in verse 30, and we were in 30 last week, but we're just, just to put everything in context here. <laughs> so in verse 30 of Acts 15, so when they dismissed, were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, this letter that they brought, which when they had read, they, the people, rejoiced for the consolation. The people were stoked. It's like, okay, we can be part of the way. We can follow Yeshua, worship Yahweh, and um, continue on with our lives. And so they're happy about that. 32. And Judas and Silas, because Judas is Barsabbas, right? Judas Barsabbas. He has two names, just kind of like a lot of us here do. Um, where am I? 32. Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And so these two brothers who came down from Jerusalem, they've delivered the message, they've accomplished their mission, if you will, that they were sent on. But hey, they're prophets. What, what's prophet mean? Are they, are they telling the future? No, they're delivering Not whatever the message. The they're Lord delivering God. the message of the Most High Yah. They're, you could think of it today, in, in terms of today, they're preachers or pastors or, or whatever type people, aspects of that. Um, and they're just delivering the word. And so they're there in Antioch. They presumably haven't been there before in front of this group of people. And so they're bringing the word. Have we ever seen that in our lives? Yes. Here at Shofar Mountain, I, pr I predominantly bring the word. Remember when Pastor Corey came? Yes. Mm -hmm. Pastor Corey had a word, didn't he? He brings the word. We go up the straightway. Half the time, maybe more than half the time we're at straightway, I get to bring a word. And, and so does Pastor Tatum and, and Pastor Corey and stuff like that. So it's like, hey, these are men of Yah, and so let's let them bring the word. And so that's what they're about. They're about doing the Father's business no matter who they are or where they are. You can tell our dogs to get, too, if they bother you. Okay, and so after they had tarried their space, the, these two brothers, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. And so they're dismissed. They're like, okay, your job's done here. Thanks a lot, and uh, you guys can go. And so, um, notwithstanding, this is verse 34 in King James, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Does anybody have a note in their Bible about that verse 34? It's not in any of the texts that it pleased Silas to stay there, that Silas stayed. That verse isn't in the text. However, the verse that says Silas stayed, that we're going to get to, is in the text. So it's not wrong per se, Silas did decide to stay. The brothers were released, but Silas did decide to stay. And this is, this is important. 
Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of Yahweh with many others also. And so they're like, hey, we're here. We've brought everybody back. The people are relaxed. They're happy that they can follow the way. And so we're going to bring them some more knowledge, some more meat. We're going to feed these people. Verse 36, and some days after, so they'd been there a while, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of Yahweh and see how they do. See, Paul has a true pastor's heart, right? They went all through the land. Remember we talked about where they were up in what's today Turkey and Syria and Cyprus and just all over that part of the world. And they brought the word, the word of Yah, the word of Yeshua, being the Messiah, to all these new people, most of whom were Gentiles. And then they kind of set up little churches, right? Well, now Paul's like, I wonder how they're doing. Why don't we go see them all again? We'll do a second journey and, and check up on them and, and kind of give them course corrections, help, uh, encouragement, things like that. And so this shows that he's not just a plan it and forget it kind of guy. He, he felt something of himself in each one of these congregations. All right, so let's see what Barnabas says. And Barnabas determined to take with them John whose surname was Mark. <coughs> I'm just going to keep reading, then we're going to come back and look at this. So Barnabas determines to take John, whose surname was Mark, John Mark, but Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder, one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark, John Mark, and he sailed unto Cyprus, where he was from, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of Yah, or Elohim. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. And so he goes and does what he said he was going to do. And this is where the meat of what we're going to talk about today is. Because you can read through it in King James and go, okay, yeah, they went two separate ways, cool. But there's a lot to it. Now, remember, if you will, Paul. Before he had his conversion, Paul was like the Delta Force commando persecuting the church, right? The new church. Kicking down doors, hauling people to be killed and, and all that stuff. People knew who he was and they were afraid of him. And when I say people, I'm talking about people of the way, right? Uh, us, believers. Um, then he's on the road to Damascus and he has his conversion. You know, why do you kick against the pricks? Why do you persecute me? Dun, 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 dun. And he's like, boom, he has an overnight, con an, an instantaneous conversion. And now he becomes a, a, an apostle, right, of the way. And, and he goes out and starts preaching the word. And he goes, he continues his journey where he was going to Damascus. But now instead of persecuting the believers of the new church, he starts preaching Yeshua as Messiah. Right to, and he's preaching to Jews at this point, right to, to Israelites, to believers, and the uh, some many of the Jews take this teaching, they listen to it, and they're going, uh, uh, "Oh no, we got to kill this guy!" Yeah. And then remember, that's the cool scene where he gets lowered off the wall in a basket, and, and he has to run away, right? Okay, and so he flees, and um, matter of fact, let's just turn. Keep your finger here. We'll be back in Acts. Let's go to Acts nine. Acts 9, because you can hear me say it, or you can read it, 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed himself to join to the disciples. So he escaped, he was let down the wall, and he runs back to Jerusalem. And he wants to, he wants to join in with the disciples of Yeshua. The, the original disciples, if you will, who are still kind of hanging out there. But they were all afraid of him, and they believed not that he was a disciple. It's like, oh no, he's one of these, uh, oh, what's it called? Enforcement. Clergy response teams, um, <laughs> Mark 13, Department of Homeland Security pastors. He's trying to infiltrate this church and ruin us all. Right? I mean, that, if you could put it into modern terms today, and they're like, we do not trust that guy. That guy was just killing us by the bushel load, hauling us off to jail, and now he wants to join us, right? I mean, that, that's basically, and you can't blame him, really, right? That's like, no. But... Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he, Paul, had seen Yahweh in the way, or actually that's Yeshua, the Lord in the way, and 
that he had spoken to him and how he had reached bold, preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Yeshua. So Barnabas sticks up for Paul at a time when he probably could have been killed by his own side, if you will. The Jews are trying to kill him. He shows up into this underground cell movement of churches, and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. And Barnabas is like, no, he's cool, man. He actually talked to Yeshua, all right? And they're like, what? And so he explains that. Now, Acts 4.36, because who is this Barnabas character? It's kind of important for how he acts. Acts 4, 36. And Joseph, it says in the King James, Joseph, there was no J, it's Joseph, it's Joseph, right, Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus. And so the disciples gave Barnabas, whose name was Joseph, Right? They gave him the name Barnabas, which means son of consolation, because of how he acted. Oh. To put it in terms that no one on YouTube will understand, but almost everybody here will, his cup code name was Barnabas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? <laughs> or Barney. Um, but they did that because of a character trait he had. Right. He was a son of consolation. He tried to reconcile. He tried to calm people down and, and just tell people, you know, feel the love. Right? And so they're like, oh man, we're just going to call you the Son of Consolation, you know, your brother love, right? I mean, that's kind of what they're calling him. And now you can see, fast forward to what we just talked about, when he's sticking up for Paul to the church in Jerusalem, what's he doing? He's consoling, right? He's like, hey, chill, guys. He's cool, really. He's with us now. He's like, no, he's not. Did you hear him? Hey, I know, but he talked to Yeshua and he's good. And so this is in Barnabas's nature to be this son of consolation and comforting, that, that kind of thing. It's in his character. Now. Barnabas convinces the disciples in Jerusalem to accept Paul, right? So he's there at the, uh, at the start, really, of Paul's journey, almost. You know, he starts with Yeshua, but then it's like how he gets started with the church. And what he's all about is giving Paul a second chance. You know, he was out there trying to kill us. No, you need to give him a second chance because he's a cool guy. Because this is what Barnabas is about. You're going to see this again. Actually, I already read about it. We're just going to get to it in detail about let's give people second chances. It reminds me of my wife right, in a lot of cases. I don't, I don't know what the word for sister of, daughter of, <laughs> Artabus or whatever. But All right, so Paul and Barnabas developed this deep friendship. Right? They're, they're fast pisos in, in the way. And they're coming into this thing. They're going through all the emotion and the turmoil and the drama. And they're right there at the beginning together. And if we're back here in uh, 15, 37, Barnabas determined to, so they're friends, but Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought, no, nah, it's not a good idea to take him with them. This guy who departed from them uh, when they were in Pamphylia, and he went not with them to the work. And so there's this contention between Paul and Barnabas that was so sharp that they departed. They split one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And then Paul took Silas and, and went the other way. There's this big falling out between these guys who have basically been together since the beginning. Guys who stuck up for each other. Now, turn back to Acts 12, uh, 24. Right at the end of 12. The word of, of Elohim grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they took with them John, whose surname was Mark. All right, so here's where we get uh, Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark. They're all together kind of for the first time. And now, verse thir uh, chapter 13, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, like Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up from Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord, and fasted, and the Holy Ghost said, who said? The Holy Ghost said, the Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Who called Barnabas and Saul? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, right? Yah called, called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So who's that they? Who's fasting and praying and sending them away? 
the other? That's the church at Antioch. So the church commissions them because they were chosen by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, by Almighty Yah to go off on this work. They were ordained for this work, right? Can we agree on that? They were ordained uh, both ways for this work. Now, it's their first missionary journey, right? They're going to go, and John Mark joins them, right? Did, did we get to that part? Mm. Not yet. Next verse, I think. Um, 25. 25, right? Well, five, no. two. Five Fast and prayed that sent them away, verse 4, and so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia, and from there they sailed down to Cyprus, verse 5, and when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, little footnote, and they had also John to their minister. John Mark goes along on this journey, this ordained journey as a helper to Saul and Barnabas, right? He's when it says minister, it doesn't mean he's some dude in a white little thing with a you know black cloak minister. He's excuse me, he's ministering to Paul and Barnabas. They've got a lot of work to do, and so he's like their assistant guy, right? Probably handling logistics. It's like, hey, we got to go do this meeting, and after that, we need to do lunch, and we'd like to invite these three people. Can you set that up? Got it, boss. You know, he he's like their guy, right? So he goes with them, and then in uh, Acts twelve or six, yeah. So I just did that. And when Herod would have, hold on. Okay, so who then is John Mark? Right, because we're having this big splitting up, and it's between Paul and Barnabas, but it's because of John Mark. And so, if you go to Acts twelve, and uh, we can start in six, that's what, that's where I was. We're going to talk about John Mark. When Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping, I'm just reading this for context, between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept prison. Remember this when Peter's in jail? And then behold, an angel of Yahweh came upon him, and the light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and he raised him up, and he said, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell from his hands, and the angel said to him, Get dressed, bind on your sandals. And so he did, and he said, Cast your garment about thee and follow me. He's getting jailbreaked by an angel. Right? Amen. Of the Most High Yah. Hallelujah. Is that jail broke? Um, and he went out and he followed him, and he knew not if it was true what was done by the angel, but he thought he saw a vision. And when, when they were first past the first and second ward, they came to this iron gate that leads unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and they passed out on the street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, when he came to his senses, he said, Now I know of a surety that Yahweh has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. He's like, wow, I was rescued by an angel of the Most High. Yah, I know that I'm, I'm doing something right. Look at verse 12. That's why we came here. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. John Mark's mom was Mary who had this house, and this is where Peter shows up. Now check this out. As Peter knocked on the door of the gate, a damsel came and hearkened, and her name was Rhoda. And then remember, she, she can't believe what's going on. It sounds like Peter, but obviously it's not him. He's in jail. There's all these people gathered there. Mary had a big house. Mary was a woman of means. We, we don't really know a whole lot else about that, but she had this big house that the early church, which remember was kind of a cell church. It was underground was meeting in her church, right? She had a gate with a guard, you know, I mean, her little daughter is like not letting people in. And so it was kind of a secret thing. So she is the mother of John Mark, and then John Mark goes with them on, on this journey when they go on it. Now, you can read in Colossians 4.10, we're not going to go there right now, that John Mark and Barnabas are cousins. <laughs> All right, so John Mark comes from a, a mom who's into the way, supportive of it, is running a safe house, I would submit, and he's cousins with Barnabas. And so when Barnabas and Paul go on this journey, I'm picturing in my head that John Mark is probably a teenager, and he's like, I want to go, and his mom, who's all on fire for the word that she does these little house meeting things, says, yeah, that's a good idea, go with these two men of Yah. And so he takes off and goes. He could have been 20-something younger, but I think he's a young man. All right. So John Mark joins um, Paul and Barnabas, but look at uh, Acts 13.13. 13. He joins them for their trip, but now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos and they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. That's all, that's all Luke says here. Oh yeah, John left them there and, and he went back to Jerusalem. Why? 
mean, we're on this journey. We're kind of just getting started, and you take off and leave. It's like you were supposed to go help out Paul and Barnabas, and now you're going back to Jerusalem. Who commissioned this, this group? Holy Spirit. And what church? church Antioch? Antioch. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have email. Do you think he could have maybe went to Antioch first and at least told them what was going on before he went home to Jerusalem? But he didn't. It's like, dude, really? Because nobody from the church who commissioned these guys knew what had happened since they left. And, and now he's going back that way. But instead of going back to the church, he goes right back to Jerusalem. Doesn't say why. We're going to get into some possible reasons why at, at the end of, of today. Um, but he leads. Now, Acts 15. Let's go back there. We're going we're gonna to stay in Acts 15 because that's where we're at today. 36. Some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Hey, let's go visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of Yah and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul does not think that's a good idea to take him, this guy who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. The work of what? The work of Yah. Right? Work of the Holy Spirit. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder, one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark and he sailed to Cyprus. These guys were friends, and now there's a sharp contention between them. I got to thinking about this. I think sometimes you can only have a sharp contention when you were good friends. How can I really have a sharp contention with one of these yahoos on, on uh, YouTube who writes nasty comments to me? I don't even know this guy, right? Or gal or, or whatever. It's like, you don't even know. So how can you have a sharp contention? But when one of your friends, one of your pizos that you've gone through dangers and toils and hardship and all this stuff with turns around and has this harsh disagreement with you, that cuts to the bone. We, uh, many of us here have experienced that. Where people we thought were our friends, that's how we phrase it, right? I thought you were my friend and now look, look at how we're acting. I think that only comes when we're friends like that. Um, we don't let people get that close to us if we're not that kind of friends with them. And so they can't have this sharp contention with us. Now, it's important to understand, to notice, <clears throat> that Paul and Barnabas, their split is not over doctrine. Their split is over a personal view, a personal assessment of one person. These two guys who have been through the fire, been through the toil, faced down sorcerers and, you know, all kinds of things like that, traveled here, there, hither, and non. Um, the weather probably was bad at points. You know, they probably slept in the rain somewhere. I mean, they didn't have hotel, motel sixes back then. Um, these two guys are splitting over one guy because they don't see it the same way. Paul does not judge this guy, John Mark, worthy to rejoin the the. the yeah. The, the, the group. He cannot come. No, I really think he should. Barnabas is living up to his nature. He's trying to give him a second chance. Just like he said, let's give Paul a second chance. It's who he is. It's in his name. Son of consolation. And Paul's like, uh-uh. This guy doesn't deserve a second chance. And Barnabas is like, I really think he does. Now, Barnabas is kin with this guy. Right. I don't know enough about Hebrew Israelite history culture back in the day to know if they treated kin like they do here in the Ozarks or like they do in West Virginia. But blood is thicker than water. And they're talking, I'm talking, you know, they're both brothers in the way. And so there's, so is John Mark, a brother in the way. So we're all equal there. But me and John Mark have kinship blood, right? And you're talking about my kin. I can kind of sense on it. I'm not saying that is what it is, but I, I can feel that. The bottom line is, Neither one of these two men will budge. Barnabas says, I really think he should come. Paul says, no, I'm not feeling it. And they just escalate, escalate, escalate. And so the split happens. And they go their separate ways. Now, they both continue doing Yah's work. Barnabas goes with Silas this way. Paul takes, um, no. Barnabas goes with uh, John Mark this way. And Paul and Silas go this way. They're both doing Yah's work. And you know what? They're probably being more effective because now instead of one group of two or three, 
going around, there's two groups of two going around. And so actually it's working to uh, Yah's greater glory that they split. This is not to give us as believers the, the, the permission to have splits over, over silly things like this just because it worked out here. Because God will not be defied, right? His work is going to happen like he wants it. But it is kind of interesting to note that things actually got better. There was more work done. Now, Paul is unhappy with John Mark because he flipped around and went back to Jerusalem. And he didn't stay the course with the guys he quit, right, um, is the way I am inclined to look at it. And so why did he quit? Why did he return to Jerusalem? Why did he not continue on? I'll tell you right now, it doesn't say why in the Word. Luke is pretty scrupulous about just kind of downplaying this thing. You can see Luke is like telling the story, but he doesn't want to get in the drama, right? He doesn't want to stir more stuff up. But I submit to you there's three potential reasons that he, that he went back to Jerusalem. Um, and there's probably truth in some or all of them, what they are. The first one is that he just quit for whatever reason. The journey was about to get harder. They're heading up into the mountains of Turkey, right? They're going to Perga. It's getting harder. And he could have just quit. He could have just said, I am out of here. Um, and so then here's two stories, quick stories. When I was in ranger school, it was hard. It was designed to be hard, and most people did not complete ranger schools. Eight-week school when I went through in the Army. And people would quit all the time, left and right. And all you had to do, there would be two instructors with about 30 students out in the middle of the woods for days on end, and all you had to do is go up to the instructor and say, I quit. And you were gone, right? They would just take you right out of that, and if you quit ranger school, you could never go back to ranger school again, if you quit. And so a lot of guys would come up to, the, let's say, Brother Jason's the, the ranger instructor, they'd go, go, oh, Sergeant, my leg hurts, I, uh, I can't continue. And that what they want you to say, oh yeah, your leg's too messed up, we're going to have to pull you. If they would pull somebody out of ranger school, even for incompetence, like you're just a horrible leader, you can't stay anymore, you fail, 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 you can come back later. But if you quit, you can't come back, right? No room for quitters is a ranger mentality, and it translates into the actual ranger battalions and the ranger regiment. They do not suffer quitters at all. You cannot quit. And so if you were a quitter before, you cannot be on my team now to go anywhere. You cannot go to certain units in the United States Army if you ever quit ranger school, which has nothing to do with that unit, right? Because you're a quitter. I'm getting there's a sense of that with Paul. Another quick story in the, in the selection course I went to for Special Forces, shorter course, 41% of the people passed. Most of those people who didn't pass quit, right? And all you had to do was utter the word. In ranger school, you could tell the ranger instructor, I think I might have to quit. And he'd actually talk to you about it. In special forces, if you used what we called the Q word, you were gone. And nobody ever saw that guy again. You couldn't use the Q word. That's how much they looked at quitting. You can't quit. And it, it's, it's designed for a long-term effect to develop men who will not quit under pressure. Right? And so the, it starts right there at the beginning. And so I think there was some of that with Paul. Paul could not stand. He hated, if you will, quitters. Paul was certainly no quitter. If you think about it, Paul was a lot like a ranger when he was going after the church. He was kicking down doors, and he wasn't shooting people in the face, but he was grabbing them and stabbing them and putting them in. He was hooding them and zip-tying them and carrying them out, right? I mean, come on. That was Paul. So I think part of it is he just couldn't stand quitters. Now, Another reason is that I think Paul could see this as separate reason, but perhaps related. Paul could see John Mark not continuing as denying the Holy Spirit. Denying the Holy Spirit is the only unforgivable sin, and we've talked about that, and it's not directly related to this, but it's a serious thing, right? The Holy Spirit commissioned them to go on the trip. By him saying, I'm joining this trip, I'm going to hook on to you two guys. There's a lot of ways where he was kind of blessed with, with this Holy Spirit mission, if you will, too. And he quits it and he stops. Um, <laughs> Yeshua said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of, God, uh, of heaven, of God. 
If you start this journey and you look back and you quit like Lot's wife, you don't deserve the kingdom. You can be a pillar of salt. Yeshua said that. Oh, he was a soft and loving man. He understands if people have a change of heart. He, he understands if people quit. Does he? Because he just said they're not fit for the kingdom of Elohim if they do. This is a pretty harsh word. Paul studied Torah hard. You know he took that same discipline and studied the words of Yeshua. He knew Yeshua. He knew what Yeshua said. And it's like, hey, he said nobody who quits is going to inherit the kingdom. He can't come with us. This is a God, Holy Spirit ordained journey. And that guy is not coming with us. And Barnabas is like, dude, we got to give him a second chance, man. I think he's, he's had us change of heart. I think he'll be okay. No, he, this is an important mission. This is a mission for the Most High Yah. We are taking the word out to the world. We are having success with Gentiles coming to understand this. And we're not taking this guy who quit on us before. It's a bad uh, message that we're sending just by bringing him along. Can you not see Paul thinking that way? I can see Paul thinking that way. you got to follow through. That's what actually Yeshua was talking about. Yeshua was talking about when he, when he said about the plow, he was talking about he had a destiny to fulfill and he set his face steadfast towards Jerusalem. Because I'm, I'm following this thing through. I'm going to see this thing through. Because Yeshua was no quitter, right? Paul's like, we're not going to tolerate quitters on this journey, especially this one. This is important. So that, that's one. Another possible reason uh, why John Mark quit the journey, because they started out preaching to who? Where were they preaching? Synagogues. Go to Cyprus, they're preaching to synagogues, they're preaching to Jews, but they start having success with Gentiles, non-Israelites, right? Those Greeks out there, and it's starting to build and build and build, and so you know John and Barnabas are talking about this, you know, at night. Hey, man, do you see all those Gentiles come to the way? Who believed it, man? It's like, wow, we're having good success. So when we get to Turkey, we're going we're gonna to see some cool things, and there's good thought and good belief that John Mark was not digging it, taking it to the Gentiles. It's like, oh, no, we're not going to take it to those Edomites. You know, put it in today's, today's terminology, those white-eyed devils. They can't have the word. They're not of Yah. They're not Israelites. They don't deserve this word. You're, you're focusing on them. Jesus, Yeshua said, I come not but for the, law, the house of the lost, house, lost sheep of Israel. And you're talking to Gentiles. What are you doing? Yeah, but we're having success. The Holy Spirit, they're excited. it. So he goes back, he doesn't go to Antioch, the people who commissioned him to do this. He goes back to Jerusalem. What do we read next coming out of Jerusalem when, when we're reading in the Word? Those Pharisaic circumcisers show up on the scene. Oh, right. He went right back to Jerusalem, and out of Jerusalem comes these guys going, Whoa, 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 no. Huh. You get circumcised before <laughs> you come in here and hear this. They're trying to put the kibosh on this whole Gentile thing. I think there's a lot of that going on with him. And if that's the case, then Paul's looking at it like he's subverting our mission. He tried to ruin us and almost stopped us once. Do you remember when we got called back to Jerusalem for that Council of Elders thing? That could have gone either way, Barnabas. You know, it went our way, but it could have gone either way and this whole thing could stop. And it's because of that guy, because he went right back there. Who was he talking to when he went back there? What was he saying about us when he was back there? And then now, next thing comes out, these Pharisees come telling our people they got to be circumcised. How do you think they got that idea? Why do you think they came all the way from Jerusalem out to where we were? It sounds to me like this definitely could have been something that Paul was thinking about. So... <clears throat> Hmm. We're almost done. Paul and Barnabas are dear friends. Barnabas is there, helps Paul get the start. They go through all those, those toils together. He's all about second chances. He's trying to give John Mark a second chance. No. And he sides with his kin. Whether he does it because he's kin or not doesn't matter. He sides with his cousin. And they split off from Paul. And Paul says, fine, Silas, you come with me. Um... So let's grab some learning points from that. Paul and Barnabas and John Mark are all men of Yah. They're all strong men of Yah. Just to go do these kind of things and not sit back and eat grapes in Jerusalem took some, some chutzpah, right? Some fortitude, intestinal fortitude to go out and do that. And so if you're a strong man of Yah, that means you're strong. 
And what does strong mean? They're stubborn. They're hard, right? They've got their, I'm a strong man of Yah, and I'm not giving in. Because if I'd have given in to you, I would have given in to that, that uh, wizard dude. Or I would have given in to him. Or I would have given in when it got too hard that day we were sleeping in the rain. I'm not giving in. Well, the other guy's saying the same thing. Right? Because they're strong, stubborn, and I submit to you at times arrogant. I tell you what, people who are super confident are often perceived as arrogant. Been told that many times. You know, there's, there's probably some truth in there. Um, but it is what it is. They're strong men of Yah. The other thing is, they're men. They're human. They have their faults. Paul was far from perfect. Paul was no Yeshua. Yeshua was perfect. Paul was not perfect. Barnabas certainly was not perfect. And so they're all bringing their own personal issues to the table. Whatever they may be. Pride, ego, resentment. All those things when we do deliverance, we try to cast those spirits out. Right? You think they didn't have some of that in them? You know they did. They had it. But, because they are men of Yah, and strong men of Yah, they eventually work this out. Now, a split like that, where you have a strong contention with your brother, uh, can take a long time to heal. Right? A long time to have the, let's have the hug and the back slap. To, to you know, put this behind us. But in fact, they do. Um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 9. Paul's letter to the Corinthians obviously happens after this, right? Because he's writing to the established church in Corinth. And we can just read briefly in in, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 6, Paul's writing and he goes, Or I only and Barnabas have not we the power to forbear working? Who goeth the warfare? And then he, he goes on. But what he's saying is, hey, Don't Barnabas and I, see he's holding Barnabas up as an equal now, at this point, years later, as an equal teacher, prophet, you know, evangelizer, apostle type person, if you will, of the word. And he's saying, hey, Barnabas and I can demand that you pay us, right? That's what this whole thing is. He's saying, I don't, all right? And and presumably, if if you look into this bit of scripture here, Barnabas doesn't either. Both of them go out and get jobs and work. But they're saying, hey, we, we can demand that you pay us, and you have to pay us. So here he is holding Barnabas up as an equal teacher of the word with himself. That shows you he's gotten over it a little bit uh, in years later. Um, Colossians 4. four ten. This is Paul writing to the Colossians. Aristarchus, my fellow worshiper, salutes you, bids you shalom. And Marcus, this is John Mark, sister's son to Barnabas, that means cousin to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments. If he comes unto you, receive him. What he's saying is, hey, this guy John Mark, he's the cousin of Barnabas. Barnabas, the guy who taught you the commandments. Barnabas, the cool guy, the fellow worker in the vineyard, the pastor who taught you what you know now. See how he's holding him up on on a level platform? Well, then he talks about John Mark, this guy he didn't like, right? He goes, hey, John Mark, if he comes, receive him. Maybe you guys heard that I had a falling out with those two guys. You know, maybe you heard some rumors or whatever. Hey, if John Mark shows up, let him into your assembly. Go ahead and accept him in. All right, so he's holding them up. Uh, as one. And then finally, you don't have to turn there in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.11. He says, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministering. This is like his last epistle, right, that he writes. He's dying. He's at the end. And he goes, hey, go ahead and bring Mark over here. He's good for ministering to me. All right. And so he has obviously, at least to a large degree, gotten over his bitterness, his split, his problems that he had with John Mark and with Barnabas. And so what do we learn from that today? Um, to kind of sum up. Yah's people, we're all Yah's people. We're people, right? We're messy. Yeah. How many people have heard, you know, that's the messy and messianic or something like that, right? <laughs> hey, we're messy. We all have issues and problems that we bring to the table, and we need to realize that's coming. 
with a person. You know, I love my brother Justin. He's right as rain. And I shouldn't be shocked if, if something develops and it's like, oh my God, oh my, yeah. What, what did Yeshua say about moats and beams? Yeah, before you look at that little speck of dust in Brother Justin's eye, Pastor, why don't you look in that mirror? See that two by four? Is that two by four? Is that four by six? <laughs> Stick it out of your head. I mean, we're all people. And so we got to realize that. Just like uh, the three men that we talked about today are. Paul was not perfect. Barnabas was not perfect. John Mark was certainly not perfect. But they got over it. They made up. They all, even before they made up and got over it, continued in the work of Yah. That's another thing we see today. People get into, into arguments with other believers, other brothers and sisters, and then they're like, that's it, I'm done with this whole thing. I saw that when I was still on Facebook with somebody who said that. It's like, I'm done with the whole thing. I'm tired of the drama. I'm done. We should all be tired of the drama. We should never be done with him. Right? He's the only one. We, we can't give up. We can't give up on him. That whole thing about the footprints in the sand and, you know, dude, I was carrying you. you know? um, so, what's the greatest commandment? Of the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. Um, we can never give up on Yah, no matter how much we get tired of people. And what's the second one that's just like it? Love your neighbor as yourself. We got to love the people we disagree with. We do. We got to love them. And, and we we got to realize, yeah, they're not perfect. And the way I do that is, is by telling myself, because I ain't perfect either, right? And so focus inward, focus upward, not so much outward. That's the lesson for today. Let's pray.